guys won't have to do anything. It'll just stream the Zoom call. Should be live. Thanks for tuning in, anybody who's watching. So these are the four round top music festival bassoonists. We'll all have wonderful different read backgrounds. And we're just gonna all make some reads and discuss and try to troubleshoot whatever might come up. I mean, this is what we would be doing at Round Top after you know swimming in the pool, and we'd just be hanging out and making some reads. So um yeah, I was going to start with a day one read to show you guys how I make a tip. Um, does anyone else use a uh, razor blade, a gym razor blade to put their tip in? Jordan? Um, I do when I use the Herzberg read style. I'm doing two different styles right now, but when I do the Herzberg one, yeah, I do. Nice. That makes sense. What um, do you I got to grab some real quick. I'll be back in just a second. Yeah, no worries. How do you guys put your tip in, Bridget and Peter? Oh, um, I use a knife, um, hold it backwards and kind of scrape towards me. It's what I would do with the razor blade, but with a knife. Okay. That's sort of what I'm going to do, I think. Peter, what do you do? Can you I we can't hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and start on my thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Oh, no, he's still getting his audio going. Okay. Um, so let me go up to my read here. <clears throat> this is a brand new, you can see the tip, it's not even, it's really open, right? And it's really thick. So I do, I guess what you guys said a little bit, get this plumbing pin out. So I hold it backwards, Jim razor blade. I find um, anything else that I've tried, any like American knock or non-American knockoff that I've tried doesn't seem to work. Okay, and then for me, it's about a 45 degree angle, maybe a little less, maybe I'm a little lower. That's probably 45, I'm probably down here. Jordan, what, what angle are you doing these days? Um, about the same. Just slightly less than 45. Yeah. So it's probably not going to be clear, but I'll show a different view of it. People use all kinds of stuff. Bridget, is this more or less what you're doing with a knife? Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so that's just, let's see. Oh, let me do the other Peter on yet? No. No sign of Peter's audio. And he's still working on it. It was working just an hour ago. Oh, bless him. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Weird. Okay. Hi. Hi. So tell us about how you put your tip in. Um, so I have been using a tip profiler, um, and that doesn't get it quite as far as I want. So then usually I take it down with a file, um, from there. Cool. So that's, I'm just trying to show you, you've got like a big cliff right at the edge now. And I'm focusing on the number 45 pin there. You can kind of see that, right? Yeah. And you just go parallel all the way across the tip, right? I did parallel. Sometimes I'll do more back here in the corner, you know, mm -hmm. but um, that's a good point. Do you usually go more on the sides, Jordan? Uh, that's something I've been experimenting with a little bit recently, and I've just been kind of curious. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. That's, that's awesome. I don't know. Did I send you guys? Let me let me send you guys the YouTube chat. Whoops. Um, so that you can maybe moderate 
Bill Bookman is scraping along. <laughs> okay, because no one else has access to our Zoom. Let me put this in. I wonder if the Zoom comments are going to be visible. There's the live stream if anyone is, I don't know. Let me know if there are any questions or comments, maybe if you have a second to look at it. Um, yeah, so, but that's really smart. Does everyone get what Jordan is saying about, let me do it. Let me do what I think you're saying, Jordan. Mm -hmm. So rather than straight across, I have it now, he would maybe go a little further back on the sides and maybe he wouldn't have gone so far back in the middle. I think it's smart because you're going to end up with a much more 3D kind of architecture rather than the very uh, 2D architecture that I have going on. So, so I guess I do, and I'm gonna get out my most aggressive file. Um, we, we can't see your read. Oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I really need a producer. Okay, here we go. Okay, now we got the read camera. Good, all right. One thing we that'll probably come up is, I'm not the most particular scraper. I don't think it's so important how you scrape, but super important where you scrape. So, you know, I want this area to be lower than this area and that to be lower than that. So I really just need to make sure I scrape the most over here and a little bit here and a little bit there. That's more important to me than you know, if I scrape forward or back, this is going to cut less if I scrape with the grains. This is going to cut more if I scrape across the grains. But I think pay the most attention to exactly where you're scraping over anything else. Something that's been helping me lately. Does anyone not use files? Um, I use files for the Hersberg. I use a knife for the Garfield. So. Okay. I mean, I use I do use, I use, use files though for the Garfield application, like when I'm scraping out quite a bit in the back, but for the tip work, I generally use a knife. How has that transition been, Hans? I mean, I've used a knife on and off uh, since I started read making a while back, so it hasn't been a big issue. Uh, the biggest thing I realized is that I thought I knew like how sharp my knife was and I thought it was sharp enough, but it just wasn't sharp enough, like no matter how much. Okay. And that was like the biggest thing with my teacher, John Clauser, he's like, it's got to just like be butter. It's just got to cut right off of it. And I thought it was, so I've always talked to all my oboe friends because they know what they're doing, so. Okay, smart. Do you know how to sharpen a knife now? That's my biggest thing. I don't really know. Yeah, so I have a Landwell uh, double hollow ground. I really like it. Um, it's just fun if you use the single bevel too. I think they work great too. I have one of those. But I use uh, croc sticks, ceramic croc sticks. I use a Lansky one from Amazon that I got. Uh, okay. They work really great. I mean, the nice thing about them is that it's really hard to ruin the edge of your knife because you're not like working with like a really high grit stone or something like that. I see. Yeah, that that's what I used when I used a knife. It was it was pretty foolproof. You know, it's less and there's less of an art to it, right? Because the angle of the of the stick is fixed. Yeah, it is. I mean, I try to get a little bit of like a people have different terms for like. I kind of think like a little fish hook on the end of it. So you kind of get more of the plowing motion of the knife rather than like a cutting motion like you would with a normal knife. So you kind of have to do uh, a certain angle on one side and then a kind of a higher steeper angle on the other side. So you can kind of get the cutting angle you want. But... Got it. So it's not, okay, that's interesting. You could almost, maybe you could like drill a new hole in the wood so that like one of your sticks, you know, is at this angle and the other one's at this angle to give you that. I mean, I mean that... To the stick yeah i think that would work pretty well basically what i do though is i take the knife like i have two different pegs in here thankfully for the angles and i'll do the side that's not scraping towards me so like the way i guess it'd be facing on the front side of the knife at this angle if you can even see that i seriously doubt you can uh -huh. basically this is just that perpendicular line to the base of this then at the other side and this is i guess this is the side the knife would be facing towards me no. I would just take that angle, then I would just kind of curve just a little bit to the right of that, so I can kind of get a bit steeper angle. Cool. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's not too bad, thankfully. I just asked him. 
else uses knives? I do about half and half with files. I usually do my initial scrape with a knife and then clean it out with the file. I like to use a reed knife to, to get the taper in, in the back and to kind of put the collar in on day one if the profiler doesn't set it up. Just because like I found that when I use a, a file right in the back, um, I leave too many flat spots. I over scrape. It's a little easier for me with a knife. That's awesome. I sometimes use a knife in the channels when I want to get stuff out pretty quickly. Okay. Do you guys find knife is faster or slower than your file work? Uh, I find it's a lot faster when you're working in the channels because you're working a lot more with the vertical area of the reed. If you're just like taking out the bag, for example, I think it's a lot easier with the other ones, but I definitely think knives are great for channels. And that's kind of the biggest reason I started being more heavy with the knife because the Garfield reed style is strange enough as it is, but it's super thin channels. So it's kind of, I was kind of hesitant to start on it because I've always been very, um, focused on the Herzberg style. So it's kind of a big change, but I use both still, so. Cool, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I had somebody, I think it was Jeff Kieziker who had talked to me about using um, like a curved knife so you can really get in the channels, uh, which was interesting. But when you guys go in the channels with the knife, are you using the tip of the knife? Um, yeah, almost always the tip of the knife, yeah. What a, my, other, my only other knife question, I remember always experimenting between sort of moving the knife forward versus sort of this sweeping motion. And so I, I like to do it, um, this is actually something I picked up from one of McGill's students that he taught his students. It's basically thinking of it like a pendulum. Uh -huh. So it's kind of, you do, I always like to think of it not just as the forward stroke, and that was what I was focusing on a lot, but if you really want to get a smooth surface on the blade, I think of the backstroke in addition to the forward stroke. So you're kind of doing a little pendulum motion so you get a really smooth, even surface as you're cutting. Because if you just do a forward motion, you're gonna get ridges in the cane and that's not good. And that's why files are great because you don't get that very often. So that's why knives can take a little bit more practice to get it. But I mean, they both work great. I don't really care what you use to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I found I had good results with the, actually the sort of, um, like when I would do this, I would end up with a taper that was kind of, um, you know, and I'm sure this is user error, but for me, when I would scrape with a rotation in my wrist, rather than a taper that stayed arched that way, my tapers would kind of do that, you know? And I, I tend to find this one sort of this more concave arch holds the pitch down better. So I would always sort of scrape, the blade would stay, you know, um, sort of like this. The blade would stay flat rather than the blade sort of rotating, curving. But but that was just my experience. I mean, I obviously- So kind of like a snow plow then. It's like I you just kind of slide it across the cane, the surface of it. Yeah. Forward and down and, and adjust the pressure, but um, mm -hmm. I don't really use a knife anymore, so I, that's that's from a long time ago. I think it's just always interesting to see all the different methods. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so the only thing I was going to draw here was like what Jordan was talking about. You know, the tip. Obviously, you know you don't want the side of the tip to be the same. If this is your tip, one of your blades, you know you don't want the sides to be the same as the center. That's not even a read at all. Okay, let me try this again. Drawing is hard. So right now, the sides are the are the same thickness as the center, right? Let's do this thing. And so, you know what Jordan was talking about is you would have cut off more here, and so you'd actually have something approximating a diamond. You know, the tip opening, I think we want something like that, something like a diamond. Obviously, this is not going to be good, or maybe it is in a certain read style, but in my read style, it's not going to be good. And neither is the Whataburger tip, which to me is just like a brand new read. 
You know what I mean? Do you guys have Whataburger where you're from? Oops. No. No, I do not. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. Well, Whataburger has these really wide hamburgers that, you know, they're just, they're basically just really wide and flat. Um, so you just don't want, like, you just don't want that sort of, you know, oval tip opening. That just won't play at all. It'll be really honky and bad. So again, that's what Jordan was talking about. That's what I was trying to, as I was scraping, you know, I worked the most here and a little bit here and almost none here, you know, and that would give us in theory, this diamond, whoops, not Siri in theory. Uh, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, the, the reason that I, I brought it up, when, and I, I was curious on if you agreed with doing that on a day one, is because over the past couple of months, I've noticed that I struggle a little bit with um, getting a like an even taper without any flat spots, just right at the tip, um, out towards the corners. Um, and I think that by doing that on day one, it helps me set that up a little bit more. That's a great point. The other thing, Jordan, I'd say on that is, you know, so I've left, you know, I didn't go to paper thin. The tip is no longer paper thin. I still have something that I can taper, you know, even though that's quite thin, there's still something I can sort of shave off and I can actually, does that make sense? So maybe don't yeah. go all the way to paper thin, right? Mm -hmm. on and then the other thing I'd say to that is don't worry about, I'm, so people try to put the taper you're talking about, right? Like they want the thickness here to be thicker than there. So they'll, they'll go, they'll start their file here and they'll scrape all the way to there, right? I mean, that's sort of, and they'll maybe try to press harder at the, at the end. I would say that's exactly how you're gonna get a flat spot from here all the way to there. Instead, I would scrape three times right here, you know, two times right here, one time right here, and you know, half the time right there. And that's actually gonna give you that taper that you want, you know? Okay. So, so maybe pay attention to that. Don't worry so much about like some macro scrape. Just keep it really simple in that like, scrape the most right here and, and so on. I mean, obviously that would give you a little tiered thing that you don't want, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. That makes sense. Let me just, I'm going to do the other side that I didn't do. And then Jordan, maybe we'll do your reef. Um, okay, let me go back to the other view. So, all right. So, Here's the set I haven't done yet. All right, so this is the bad way, not the bad way, but this is the way that I've put in a flat spot from here to there. Does that make sense to you guys? We're probably talking in, we had the same teacher, so we might be using some common language. Does it make sense what we're talking about? Yeah, I like. I think you mentioned this in one of your past videos. I watched like some of your Oberlin live streams, but like kind of how you try to blend it into the plaque, basically. It's like the notion of it, which I think is yeah. like a great way of thinking of it, like how it just tapers into the plaque. Sure, but and, and but even so, we're almost so, more talking about the center to side taper. Yeah, I want this to be five units, four units, three units, two, one, so that this is thinner than that, you know. Or, or you mean Hans? You mean the plaque over here? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. I got as you. As you approach the corners and such. Right. Okay, great. So what I would, what I used to do is I would say, oh, great. I want this to, so I'd start scraping here right in the middle and I would try to like curve the file up so that I, that's going to result in way too much being scraped right there because I started scraping there. And then I'm either going to rip the corner off or something because it's too complex to sort of move the file like that. So instead, I'm just going to get this to do what I want. 
I'm scraping about here to there. I'm going to get that to go into the plaque how I want. Okay, now I'm going to move back now about here to there. Okay, next step. Each step of the way, I'm just blending and smoothing it out. The reason the vertical scraping is good, even though it takes off less cane, and I know uh, Caymans would yell at me for doing this. He believes in scraping only across the grain. I like the vertical because it lets me scrape exactly at this angle, not this angle and not this angle. If I scrape horizontally, I'm more liable to wobble personally. So maybe that's just a flaw in my scraping, but that's how I would achieve what you're talking about, Jordan, is a series of vertical scrapes so that I can control the angle, if that makes sense. So that's sort of what I would end up with. Let's see. It's not going to focus that close, is it? All right. But you can see this tapers and this is the same all the way out. So anyway, that's my day one. That's part of what I do on day one. Um, I would make it play, whoops. I would make it play like scales at least. You know, it should articulate scales at one dynamic at least. So just kind of play. So this would not be finished, but that's just what I want to do for the sake of time. Jordan, do you want to do your read? Do you, does anyone else have a read thing they want to do right now? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Tell us about the read. Cool. Um, so I have, this is a day uh, three or four. Um, it's a little bit further in its life. Let me, sorry, let me get this set up. What do you guys, there are other three of you, how do you test like a day three, four? What are you looking for the read to do? Um, for a day three or day four, I mean, the biggest thing in my reads is just like mostly checking the response. If the response is there, I feel like a lot of other things are generally in place as long as intonation is pretty close to where it needs to be. Um, I mean, obviously, I want to check for like, you know, like evenness of resonance throughout the registers, like low and high end. Of course, reads will be generally, they won't play all that stuff themselves. They might have a habit of like, this might be a good Tchaikovsky 6 or a good red spring, that kind of thing. But I want to just kind of have a fairly even scale at that point, maybe not super even because I like to break my reads over quite a bit of time myself. But that makes sense. What are, what about the other two? What do you guys look for? Yeah, at this point, I'd want the read to feel like reads I've played on before. Um, in terms of response and pitch, I don't want to have to work a lot to get it somewhere that it doesn't want to be. How do you test the pitch? I'll usually do tapers on like D's and F sharps in the staff. Um, see if it wants to drop off on an E or a C sharp. Um, and then upper register and lower register tests as well. Okay. What did Peter, maybe, what do you, what are you still day three or is day three you expect it to do everything? But if, if not, what do you allow it to not be a finished read on day three? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm mostly by day three, I'm pretty much expecting it like by a third day of scraping, I'm expecting it to respond and play um, fairly um, in tune across the whole register. Um, uh -huh. But the some of the things that I let still be there are a little bit of like, um, maybe a little bit of edge in the sound. Um, uh -huh. If that's still there, that's okay for me on day three, then I want to play it and keep, you know, maybe making small adjustments here and there. But in terms of a read making it to day three of scraping, I pretty much want it to respond and play in tune if I had. Okay, excellent. Jordan, do you want to play it now? And Yeah, sure. Um, do, whatever tests, do whatever tests you would do on this read, Jordan. Sure. I'm going to plug in my microphone. Let me know if it sounds okay. All right. A little quiet, but go ahead, play some bassoon, it might be perfect. Good. 
good. Yeah, it sounds just right to me. It's good. Cool. Um, so what I would normally do, um, I, and I read this in this stage, um, is I would just do Hertzberg scales to start off and see if it it's closing in the higher register, if it's generally sharp in the low register. Um, and just uh -huh. that. Um, do so, one of those. Yeah. I'm going to put up my metronome. Um, can, can you hear me okay? I talk. Yeah, yeah. So what I notice about this read is that it's very free blowing, um, but it's closing up in the high register um, and it's quite unstable in the tenor register. So I need to add a little bit of strength to it. Um, I probably need to open the tip a little bit at the first and maybe the second wire. Um, okay. okay, do it. Let's Let's hear it. So this is where the tip opening is at now. Uh -huh. So I'm going to open both the wires. So the tip is maybe the same openness, but now the reed is more round. Yeah. Um, I, I actually more round. Yeah, it's just generally more round. And I, I opened the, the first wire a little bit more so that it's slightly more open than it was. Thoughts? It's better going in the right direction, but it's still, um, it just has this quality in the tenor and high register that I sometimes I find and I don't really know how to fix. Yeah, one thought I have on that. So when I the initial tip opening to me was closer to the sort of oval thing, maybe than I would want. And I think this could be if we could go towards a diamond. Mm -hmm. I think that might give you that's too open. But you know what I mean? Less um, that might give you what you're, what you are looking for. That might sort of give it that structural strength without, um, sort of, uh, making it harder. I don't know. Although I, it did sound much better what you just did. Um, I, with a, a day three or four, I like to start, uh, sort of incorporating the way the read feels, how I want a mm -hmm. ideal read to feel. Right. Um, and I, I, I agree. I think that kind of scrape might push it closer to that direction. I just okay. want to get a little more comfortably across yes. the zoom. So what I think the difference between that that read tip opening and this tip opening, the more diamondy, this one is really bulky and just, you know, it doesn't do what you want. And this one is more compliant. Um, this one has worse dynamics. And this one is like more free in a way. I think the reason these two exist is you're, they have different center to side tapers. So the first one is going to have you, the read, the blades are more flat. They're more parallel. And the second one, the reads are more, you know, tapered neither is is good or bad i think it's just a spectrum um so so what i would look for jordan is try to see with holding the read at maybe some angles is there too much here like does this really taper does this point taper from here 
or is the whole thing actually parallel? Because remember, this is the gouge. So if you're parallel to the gouge at all times, that's no taper. Even though, you know, like technically this is down here, it doesn't taper because you're not interested in the distance from this dotted line. You're interested in this distance. Does that make sense to everyone? And this is five and this is five. Even though this one up here is, you know, nine. So you say, oh, it went down nine units. Well, it doesn't really because what you're measuring against is actually curving. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then what Jordan, maybe, again, this is all maybe, and your eyes trump everything. If you don't see this, throw it out. That's, that's the only problem with this online. You know, maybe we need to do that. And so then it would go five, four, three. And that would give you more of this uh, diamondy tip opening up here. So that might be something to look into. Okay. Look at it with the plaque in, holding different angles. This is something I got from Keith Bunky. He's always looking, you know, with the read sort of at these various angles. You know, he's not just looking head on. He might scrape head on, but then he's looking and not completely horizontal either. Sometimes you can see things like this read will be a good example because I know it doesn't have any tapers back here. When I look at it here, it looks like it tapers. That looks like it goes down. But when I look at it here, I see somehow I combine this and I see this and I realize, oh, that doesn't go down at all. All I'm seeing is the gouge. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, try that. Um, so one of the things I'm noticing with this read, um, and I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head, is that um, it does taper directly at the tip, but it also doesn't go very far back. Um, it okay. looks very flat, kind of. Can you guys see okay? Yeah, great. Kind of up in here, uh, along just to the side of the rails. Um, so I think I need to kind of bring that taper a little further back and put more of a, a shape into the tip. Great. While you're doing that, what do you, any thoughts? You guys have any thoughts on that or? I have a quick question. Uh, how much of the tip opening adjustments do you do with scraping versus wires? I know they're very different adjustments, but I guess when is like the time that you would make those adjustments scraping versus with the wires? That's a really good question. Um, I don't, my answer would be I default to the wires because you can put it back um, and it's way easier and it's more kind of obvious, I think. But when I've messed with the wires and I, and I can't get it where I want it, then I'll start looking for the tapers being messed up. And then my eye gives me permission to scrape the side, basically. I find in this, in this sort of Van Hosen Hertzberg read that I'm in between, um, you know, I want to keep the sides and I want to keep the rails as, as thick as possible. And I don't want you know, my channels to get really scraped out. But um, so I tend to, I really have to justify it with a few different points. You know, it has to be like a thought, like I think this will help and I have to see that it would help and then I'll do the scraping, if that makes sense, Bridget. But oftentimes, I guess I would also say I find I need to do that more because I shy away from it. So I found if I, you know, I really try to set up the tapers in the back and the, the whole read, I need it to taper, meaning I need, I need this one right here. I need that to happen from day one. To me, tapering is the most fundamental principle of a read. You know, this is, this is center to side, but also back to front. If anywhere on the read, you have this, this one, right? This one right here, like this is just game over because it just won't, it won't play. No, no data I get from it seems to be reliable. It's just like too, too wild for me. So 
I guess that's sort of my take on it. I don't know. Hans, do you have a different, like, what do you feel like with the Garfield style? How, how do so, the... the best way I can put it is when I'm making a Hertzberg read or a Garfield read, I have like two different head spaces. I have to like accept like the read theory going on with the Hertzberg. And then I kind of have to like exit my head and go into a different one when I make the Garfield one, because basically everything, like you said, like is kind of not what goes on with the Garfield, um, which is fine. Like I'm perfectly fine with that. Like, I think it's great that I had the experience with the Hertzberg one that like I, when you say these things, I'm like, yep, that that's exactly right with the Hertzberg read. Um, the Garfield read is just berserk, I guess. Um, it, I was really, I really didn't, like, I was really hesitant. Like, I didn't even start working on it until, like, after my first semester at CIM um, when I came this past fall. And I was worried about it, but I finally, like, started getting into it. And, I mean, it works for me. I think what I've liked is I had some issues with the tenor range being a bit flat. Um, with the Hertzberg read style. And I mean, that might be some things I just need to correct with the scrape and such, but I figured, especially with the quarantine going, I could invest a lot more time since I have it to kind of develop the Garfield read. But um, sure. to go along with your saying with the scrape, the Garfield read, um, I mean, you have to get your profile set up correctly, like, so it's the right thickness, but you actually don't touch the rails at all, like from start to finish. The rails are kept completely as they are, and then you take a lot out of the channels. So there kind of isn't that even taper. I mean, I extremely go for symmetry. Symmetry is extremely important to me. Uh, but in the Garfield read, you kind of just scrape it to make sure it's getting the response you need. But I definitely absolutely agree with you when it comes to the Herzberg read, though, like everything you say is like resonating with me. <laughs> cool. Great. No, no. Yeah. And, and I, I'm actually really interested in, I love hearing the differences. And, um, you know, when you talked about the, so then the Garfield read, you're setting up the rails essentially from the profiler. I feel like on the Hertzberg read and especially Cayman's version of it, he's setting up this this critical point, you know, God, Siri. Uh, he's setting up this critical point where that's set in the profiler and he's tapering everything forward from that and he's tapering to that point. You know, um, I mean, it's basically the same in a Sakakini read. Peter, I'd say, you know, you were saying you're sort of making that like it's it's three eighths of an inch back for Sakakini. It's two and a half eighths of an inch back for Caymans and some of what I did with Bean. So um, I think it's just fascinating all the differences. And I'm really interested in what principles um, transcend all the styles, you know? So I think that's that's fascinating too, to investigate. And, you know, like the Garfield with the low back, I think is, is cool. You can hear that in the way, I think the read is relatively free blowing. It's not really resistant. And then it, it dampens it, so it's darker. I mean, I, I will say with the graphic read style, it's not like um, Mr. Claus or my teacher, he does kind of a, a little bit of a wider shift than even Garfield did. Um, so the resistance of the read is actually, it's definitely more free than the Hertzberg, but I kind of customized it. I'm kind of in the process of experimenting with it. Like the cutoff length for the Garfield read is generally about 27 millimeters, but I've actually been doing 28, kind of like the Hertzberg read style. Um, it's just kind of messing and playing around with it. I think the biggest thing for me that's helped with read making is that it's kind of strengths and weaknesses that if you do remove material from one place of the read, you have to make sure it's being placed somewhere else that's going to help retain that strength in the read. Totally. Uh, that's like the totally. most so, basic level I can think of it. No, that makes sense. And they all trade off. And I think that's the danger of taking one thing from somebody's read style. You don't have all the other compensating factors, you know, I mean, with the Clouser read style, you know, and he's playing on a 7,000 series with a pre-war vocal and so there's all these things that go together and I think that's the danger, but it's also what's cool about learning about each other's styles. Cause maybe you actually have a bassoon that plays more like a seven than whatever your teacher. I mean, I'm playing on a 240 Renard and the 240 Renard, if I remember correctly, is actually based off of um, Renard Garfield's bassoon from what I've remembered okay. hearing. So, I mean, it, the nice thing about Renards in general with Fox instruments is that they can play almost any read style. I mean, I was at Domain Forget last summer and Laurent Defer, the teacher at Paris Conservatory, he had me play on one of his reads and like, I could barely play on it, so it was like this massive read, but like it played on the instrument. I just like was trying to struggle with the amount of air I had to put into the read, but I mean, it, they're really versatile instruments, so. Yeah, yeah, cool. Jordan, how is the, how is the taper coming? It's coming. <laughs> okay, Do you ready to test it? Let's just. No. Well, I'm just finishing up the, the second side. I'm trying to okay. get it back a little bit further. Yeah, so bring, okay. Uh, 
do you guys have a read, Bridget or Peter? Does the next person want to start their read test or question? Or Hans? I've got Hans is somehow you're in that order. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can. I have a day, kind of like a day three or day four, kind of like Jordan had. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I can give it a try and see. I need to see if my microphone set up enough will be really ringy in your guys' set or not. Like I said, I have a Zoom H4N Pro that I have set up, so hopefully it does something. I think it worked well for the lesson that we had earlier, so. Yeah. All right, let me give it a try and see if hopefully I'm not too close to the microphone. Um, so before I play on it, I think the biggest issue I'm having with this read is definitely just response. I think response, again, is like the biggest thing for me. I think overall it's playing mostly register. It's just a bit tubby, I guess would be a good word for a low, down low. And it's a little bit on the sharp side too. I think it's about 10, 15 cents sharp. Okay. How's it coming over there? Is it, is it all right? Or? It's a little high. It's a little high. You could turn your mic down a bit. Okay, give me just a couple seconds. I had it at 55, um, I'm gonna put it down to 30, see if that does anything. Again, I am kind of seated a bit close to it, so if it is not too much. Your voice sounds really good. Your voice sounds perfect. Okay, that's great. Better? Better. Okay, so a couple things I would check first um, would probably be I would just do some like really basic so I was like I would just do like maybe F major scale, maybe just two octaves just to get a really basic start of like what is this redoing. Okay. Maybe just mezzo forte basically. I'll start diving into more of the responses after that. I just I actually haven't warmed up very much myself, so <laughs> that's okay. No worries. <laughs> check to sure this goes with everyone basically but um, I like to check E flat without the right hand side just to see if that E flat because if the reads too heavy like almost always will be spiking up in pitch and I think that's like a really good indicator if like the reads too heavy which in case I'm sure this one is okay I'll just go between D and E flat <laughs> is a bit more open than what I like, and I think that might be one of the reasons why it's just kind of I'm all over the place. I think the sound is not very centered, in my opinion. Okay. Do you want to play, would you play a full scale, like, low to high, like, oh, yeah, B yeah. flat major or something, to, and tongue all of it? Yeah, I'll just play a C major or whatever. Do you have a yeah. tuner? Tuner with you? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> screechy on the high end in my opinion um again i think the read is just a bit too open okay Good. i mean that would explain I, if it it doesn't it's hard to tell with the mic because it sounded fine but i trust you hearing it live um it, that would explain if it's it, too open and it's going to make you blow really hard that'll make yeah, it kind of yeah. screechy and that's kind of how it feels right now i mean the one of the big things too mr Cosgrove always tells me with the garfield style is that and this kind of goes when you get to the point of the finishery, which case this is not. So it's fine that I'm making, I'm flattening the wire, but for a finishery, it's actually, you want it to be almost completely round on both wires. Like you look through the butt end of the reed and like you look through it and you basically see like a complete circle all the way through. Okay. So it's kind of strange in that sense, but it's fine if it's flat to begin with. It's kind of the end goal to get it round. I see. <laughs> a bit so 
it's still squealy up there, which is fine. Again, it's a new read. Uh, let me check down low though. Easily 15 cents throughout. It's just a heavy read still. Yeah. So then let's do. Um, why don't you just scrape? You said in you scraping in the channels is one of the bigger things. I mean, the response actually seems okay. I guess if you yeah for I mean it's still a new read, so I'm not gonna be. I mean, I generally response is the big thing I'm going after, but I generally like I used to be really impatient about trying to scrape them in. Like, there's different ways of going about it, of course, but. For me, I found if I let my reads break in over the longer period of time, I get better results. But again, it's just each to their own. Um, but yeah, for this read, I like I use the light a lot. I like to use a plaque too, like you do. Like you can see through the read, which is nice into the plaque. You can kind of see how thick it is. Um, I really like to use a light though. But basically, what I'm doing, I, I know you can't see what I'm doing, but basically I'm just seeing that there's symmetry on either side of the spine. It's a very, very heavy spine on the Garfield read. And what I want to do to check for responsiveness, especially um, in this case up high, I think I just want to do a bit more in the channel just to enunciate or accent the spine a bit so there's kind of more relative strength yeah. spine into the sides. Because to me, what you've got is you need, so if you're not allowed to work, you know, you're not allowed to work here looking, you know, on the rails with the Garfield read, you, you need more structure from the spine to the you yeah. Know, this... So I totally agree with that. That makes sense. And another option I could do too is I think rounding the second wire would help a bit too. Just kind of give me more on the closing of the tip opening, which I'm wanting is in addition to kind of helping support the tenor range. So that makes sense. And you guys hear how the, the high notes kind of split, mm -hmm. spready split. That to me is it's too much this one where there's no taper and we need more of this, this one. Yeah. Where the reed has more taper. So. Jordan, do you want to try yours? You ready to test? Yeah, sure. Okay, while well, Hans is scraping. Did you see, Jordan, some places that didn't taper? Yeah, I did. Um, especially, um, it was a little bit flat right alongside the spine. Uh, okay. A couple of back, I had to taper that out a little bit more. Cool. So it's, it's really like boomy now. It's vibrating a lot more. Bridget or Peter, thoughts on why it's more vibrant now on a really macro level? Um, I guess if there are some bumps that were removed, then that'll allow more vibrations in the blade. Uh, they won't stop when they hit the bumps. Okay. Yeah, and just anytime you take cane out, you're going to cause a freer blowing more vibrating read. Um, uh, even if you're adding structure somewhere else, it's just going to vibrate more. Totally. I think that's, yeah, that, that's sort of what I think. That's one of those macro principles that I think does transcend even Garfield, Hertzberg, Millard, whatever. You know, if you scrape the reed, it's going to be, what are some of the things? So we just said more vibrant. Um, in a way, I mean, and all of these, of course, depend on where you scrape it, right? So we'll get into that next. But if you scrape through, it's going to be more vibrant. It's going to be less strong materially. What else? Um, it's it's going to be flatter in flatter in absolute pitch. Okay, but let's say now. So we, we've got scrape, we're going to do this, we know these things, but let's say we're going to scrape in the back and the middle. So what are some, what's going to happen if we scrape in the back? 
What's going to happen to the stability? It's going to be more flexible. Yeah, so, so more, I heard like flexible, um, if I can spell, flexible, more unstable, right? Um, what about the hardness? Is it going to be harder to blow or easier to blow? Easier. Easier. Easier, right. Um, how about the sound spreadiness, that crack thing that was happening on Hans's high notes? Well, yeah, actually, that's more of this. Let's answer that down here. So we're going to scrape in the middle, not the sides of the back. We're going to scrape in the middle of the back. What's going to happen to the spreadiness? Sorry, I didn't catch that. I was playing on the instrument when you said that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, what were you saying? I think if you scrape in the middle, anywhere in the middle, tip middle, middle middle, or back middle, that's gonna you're making the read more of a flat thing because we just you know rather than this read has more scraped on the sides, this read has the same scraped everywhere, or you could say more scraped in the middle. Does that make sense? This one is gonna spread and crack. This one is going to focus, but it's going to have no dynamics. You know, this one is going to have dynamics. It's going to be flexible. Um, it's going to be resonant, really rich. This one is going to be, well, rich is a loaded word. Let's, let's get rid of that. This one is going to be darker, more stuffy, less flexible, less dynamics. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so we have to sort of assess all of these. And so if we scrape, let's say the middle of the back, well, we're scraping, so that's actually gonna be like plus one for vibrant. But because we're in the back, I think this is actually gonna be like maybe plus two for dampening. Um, I think the closer you scrape to the tip, the more brightening that has. So these two, you know, this plus one vibrant and plus two dampening, they kind of cancel out to like the net is sort of like a negative one bright. Does that make sense? No, definitely. I mean, when I am doing the triangle tip in the Garfield Reed style, um, I did forget to mention there is one exception with the rails, the triangle tip on the rails, so probably like the top third of the reed you actually do remove the rails on that portion of it. And they actually do like paper thin rails on that port on that part. So it's kind of in complete contradiction to the rest of the rails. Um, the big reason for doing that and first and foremost is because the response to the read is improved in doing that, but also it kind of works to um, dull the sound. So kind of like we were saying with it, darkening the sound by scraping cane off leads, so you can't get that plus two minus one thing going on. Sure. And that's totally. So then the other factor though here, but we're also scraping the middle of the back which I think the middle is plus one for bright or bright, resonant, whatever you want to call it, buzzy, whatever. So that's going to be like another plus one here. And so then the net effect is zero. Does that sort of make sense? And it's like, you're trying to figure out if I scrape, you know, any of these regions on the read, you've got middle, Let's call that, wait, what am I doing? How many grids do I need here? I need six. So, okay, back, front, middle, and then you have sort of spine or middle, channel, and rail. Does that make sense? We have rail, 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 channel, 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 spine, spine, spine. We have tip, middle, back, something like that. You're trying to just sort all this out. What's going to happen? This is getting, this is all just sort of BS, you know, but do think about, okay, which, if I scrape here, is this going to give me the suite of results that I want? I guess is all I'm trying to get at. I also usually think about in terms of like the plus minus thing you're talking about when you scrape. Uh in the back and you're moving cane there, you're making the tip relatively thicker to totally. sort of the rest of the read. So like if you're starting to get problems with brightness, that's one of the reasons that coming and scraping farther back will help is because you're sort of balancing out and like 
Whereas you had it like here, it's starting to come like this. Right. You almost thickened the tip. It's the closest thing to thickening the tip you can do. Yeah. You proportionally thickened the tip. Yeah, that's kind of actually like one of the things that, at least from what I try to think of, again, I'm still trying to figure out the whole theory with the Klaus Reed Silas Moffing system to figure out. Um, but I definitely think that is a big part of it too. Like, because you take a lot out of the back of the reed, um, you have to have the narrow shape because that's what provides the stability in the reed. Because if you had a wider shape and you're trying to take out the back, it would just, it wouldn't be able to control the reed. And so if you do try to garfield, you have to use a narrow reed, just so you know. Um, but as for the thickness of the heart compared to the back, you actually use a quite a heavy heart in the reed. So the back of the reed, at least for me anyways, I do a little bit heavier than what even my teacher does currently. I'm just experimenting again, but the heart is actually only a little bit thinner than the back of the reed. So they're actually pretty close in thickness, which is kind of crazy, oh. but that's kind of like one of the things that is, my teacher always tells me you scrape in the back of the reed, to actually um, increase resistance, but also it darkens the sound because you're doing that, like Peter was saying, it proportionally makes the tip thicker. So like if you over scrape the tip of the reed and you're like, oh, this is too bright, this is kind of edgy, by taking that down the back, you're kind of proportionally have made that um, thicker again. Sure, makes sense. And the, I actually, sorry, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, I just, I actually used to make Garfield raids, like it's been a while since I've done that now, but one of the things about them is like I was saying, when you, where you scrape, you're, you're taking cane off and you're making the reed weaker. And yeah. so the Garfield need, reed needs all of these really important structural points because it's sacrificing cane strength and putting in structural strength. So you have a really strong spine, really strong rails, really narrow shape, so that all things, things coming together give you both the response and strength you need to read. Definitely. That makes sense. And I think, Peter, what you said, you know, sacrificing cane strength for structural strength that could be a summary of all American reed styles versus European. Yeah. They've got a lot more cane strength and probably less structural strength. And maybe our reeds are more like an oboe reed with all kinds of windows and wedges and, and stuff. But um, Bridget, what are your thoughts on the all of this strength and structure versus material strength? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, carefully choosing where you want to strengthen and how you want to achieve that um, and what other results scraping in a certain place could have. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It's... One other thing I'll just throw out there for this discussion, I think, is um, sometimes so your tenor F is really flat, right, on a new read. And it's actually, the read is actually still sharp, but it's so hard you can't blow the F up to pitch. And so sometimes if my back, you know, I'm going for whatever, if I'm making a Hertzberg ring, I'm going for 36 thousandths of an inch at the back. If my back is at 40 or 44 because I screwed up the profiler, my tenor F will be extra flat. And you think, wow, how can you fix a flat note by scraping? But again, you know, if I scrape the center of the back, you know, all of this is, is way too thick. This is 44 and it should be 36 on my Hertzberg read. I'm getting, when I scrape there, I'm getting like plus 10 resistance and only plus two, I took off cane, so I'm getting plus two flatness, but I net, you know, plus eight pitch on the F. And so I actually scrape the back and the pitch of the F comes up. The playing pitch of the F comes up. Does that sort of make sense? I think that's something I see overlooked a lot because people get too tied up in, well, if I scrape, I'm gonna make it even flatter. And the problem is you can't even blow it up to pitch because the read is so hard, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, actually that yeah, really plays really well into, I don't know if this has been your experience too, Peter, with scraping in the back, but um, my teacher always like mentions about like, there comes a point when you're scraping in the back that you're actually, I like to think of like a pitch floor where you have like that set pitch floor of like where this is the intonation on the read. Um, by taking out the back, you kind of have more flexibility in that. So you're actually basically flattening the low range like you normally would be, but you're also um, adding flexibility. So you're actually sharpening the upper range to an extent as well with the amount of flexibility you can do with the air pressure that you put into the read. Yeah, totally. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and if I could add, um... One of the things that was really a big game changer for me in my read making recently was what we're talking about, but adding time into the 
this sort of uh, idea to make a read. Um, yeah. I generally, it's in first semester, was over scraping uh, the front third of the read just too soon, trying to make it play too well too soon. Um, uh -huh. Recent, um, and Drew and I, we talked about this uh, in our lesson a little bit. I've been trying to shift to a more kind of Clouser like style of playing, something a little bit lighter, something more, um, like much more free blowing in my reads. And I've, I've actually found that if I incorporate stability, uh, into a, a read in Hertzberg specifically from day one um, and then continue to build on that um, sort of prioritizing stability um, then that's kind of how I've been able to to get closer to that style of playing on a Hertzberg read cool I, that's the awesome. flexibility that I have with, with this style I can really make it a, a wide variety of sounds a wide cool. variety that's, that's what I really like about the Hertzberg read is it's a very middle of the road shape. I feel like like that's a lot of versatility in that sense for sure. Cool, awesome. Um, Jordan, do you want to show us how the how that resulted, and then we'll do Hans and then Bridget and Peter. Do you guys have reads that you want to do? Yeah, I have one. Okay. Yeah. We'll just do quick. Jordan and Hans play it give us your thoughts and then we'll go to Bridget and Peter. Okay. <laughs> totally dead uh, I well it it was better at first when I first scraped um, huh. it went in the direction I wanted and it changed back it's pretty much identically to how it did uh, when we first started the class I so, see I see enough pace to try and make it work sure I, my process for that is I put like I put B for bad question mark on it and then tomorrow if it, if it reconfirms then I then I get rid of it. I, I same thing, and you, you can't really see it because I scraped off. But I wrote literally that on it. Yeah, nice. When it changed back, um, I figured I'd give it another day of scraping and playing to see how it would do. But at this point, I'll sure. just throw it out. Okay, great. Hans, you have a. Yeah, um, I'll just do the scale again, just tugging through, just again, checking out the high register, especially because there was kind of that distortion in the sound, cracking and such. <laughs> What I did to do that was, again, I did scrape in the channels, just kind of accent the spine a little bit. There was a little bit of um, asymmetry in the read on one portion of the blade, so I think that kind of helped in that. Um, I really like to check the tip of the read, kind of like collapsing it with my fingers just to see it's kind of evenly closing towards the center. That's really important to me, um, just the response. As for, I think the biggest thing I did, though, is actually just rounding the second wire just a tiny bit, and that did the job pretty quick, so. The read still isn't quite as centered as, as I would like. I would probably give it maybe like another day of playing on it and then I'd kind of decide if I want to throw it out or keep it. I kind of am in a similar thing with Jordan where I just make a ton of reads, a ton of reads. Like for me, my teacher always tells me this, it's like, it's kind of like an Easter icon. You're just trying to find a good piece of cane. <laughs> yeah, that's You're awesome. always looking for a good piece um, of cane. You just drill through as many reads as you can basically to find that good piece of cane. Nice, it sounds way better. And it sounded more stable too, to me. I mean, it, it just sounded more well-rounded, much more even. Jordan, yours too, honestly. I know when we, you know, we said it went in the right direction, it, you both did stuff and it just sounded more settled. So it was more in tune, you know, 90, you went up in the percentage of notes that were in tune and the ones that were sort of centered. So um, great, yeah, really good. Um, Hans, just one more thing. You said you would play on it. What are you gonna play? How much are you gonna play? Are you going to play with a drone, a tuner? Yeah, so I like to stick my 
drone work actually with my finished reads because I feel like if I'm trying to play my drones and trying to play my long tones with bad reads, I'm kind of just training my read rather than myself. Um, I generally will try to do maybe like some finger work or such like scale practice, maybe like some faster tempo and such for breaking and read. Um, for this read, I try not to play on too much. Um, I feel if I play on for too long, the tip opening might collapse a little bit and we can talk about beveling if you want to talk more about that with the read collapsing and such. But I am really, lately anyways, I've really been trying to be more patient about giving the read more time. So I'll play on it for maybe like five, 10 minutes and I'll set off to the side and just start working on another read. And then cool. I'll just kind of let the reads age. Cool, thanks. Um, Bridget's got her bassoon. All right. Um, so this is a four day old read, but I've scraped it twice. Um, so first I would just do a articulation scale test. just F major scale slow with the tuner. The pitch was looking nice. I was able to, it was comfortable, a um, few cents sharp. And so that would be something I would look at, but very minor adjustments. I stopped a few times on the scale when some of the notes didn't feel like they responded as I wanted them to. Um, so, so for that reason, I would check tip for really clean taper, make sure there's no lumps or bumps. Mm -hmm. Great. And it, it sounds yeah, and it feels good. Like, it sounds quite good. My thing would be maybe would you play the scale again and try to push the dynamics of it, or well, or say you know this is a day three. I mean, it sounds quite good for a day three. Like this is the start of day three, scrape day three, right? So yes. maybe you don't want to push it to this level yet. But can you do the scale with piano in the low, and forte up high? Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Yeah. So then the main issue you would be addressing is it's a few cents sharp for you. Yes. yes. Okay. What about um, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> So I would probably do a quick little bit of sandpaper just to see if, try to get any of the bumps there. Um, and hopefully that would take a little bit. Hmm? Where would you do that? Probably in the, the channels and close to the tip, but not the very tip. Okay, okay. My, my one thing I would say, um, you said you felt there was some uneven response at times, like certain notes didn't respond the way you wanted look at the back to just see so i would say that read is on the edge of buzzy it's it's a day three so we it should be right and i i sort of believe not to make it dark don't make the read for sound i think that's true use the sound as a tool that could tell you about the tapers so so maybe the, the fact that it's a buzzy sound means you like have great tapers here to here, and the tapers here aren't as good. So does that make sense? So the back isn't good, but the, the tip, the tapers are great. So, cause if, cause again, knowing if you scrape back here, it would mellow out the buzziness. And perhaps, now the other thing is it could be maybe here to here, uh, the taper is great. Let me draw this in the right color. So center to the tip, this taper is great. We've got A to B. 
That's a taper, right? Does that, is this coming through? I know it's probably small on your screens. But maybe back here, we have, so here's a new line. We've just got A to B, but this A to B, the blue A to B is like that, or, or actually, no, sorry, that's wrong. Maybe, maybe it's like this. And we actually want it to be something more like that. So then this is too thick. Look at the tapers in the back. Just because it's on the edge of Buzzy, let that make you question the tapers. You're only gonna go off your eyes and you're only gonna go off the tapers. You're not going off the sound. But see if there's anything there. Does yeah. that make sense? Yes. And it could be it could be a back to front taper in the back third, or it could be a center to side taper in the back third. Just in case mm -hmm. there's something there, oh, that doesn't taper, great, let me fix it. And then I just find when I taper the read, and what I mean by taper is this rather than parallel, the read tends to play better in in this read style, in this either Hertzberg or Van Hosen American read style. Okay. Does that sort of make sense? That's my thought on don't make a read for sound. I think that's true in the Hertzberg style. Now in Garfield, that might not be true. I don't, I think it's it's more sound is, is just different. It's. I mean, it's I always like to approach it in the, if you are to scrape for sound, you do it in context of response or intonation. So like yeah. you wanna do something like, say for example, you have a read that is playing flat, but it's playing sharp and like, oh, I want a darkened sound, so I'm gonna scrape out the back. Well, that just made it even flatter than it already was. So in that context, like it wouldn't be going in the same direction. You, yeah. If it's say, for example, it's the opposite where the read was sharp and it was bright, okay, I'm gonna take out the back to darken the sound, but also to flatten the pitch. And that's kind of going in the same direction. So right, which is sort of what I hope, Bridget, maybe there's something we can do to the back of the read to get you that, you know, you said it was three, four, five cents sharp. Maybe there's a taper back there that could be improved and it could be like a win across the board. Does that make sense? Yes, I already see, I see some stuff I think I could clean up. Good. Okay, so while you're doing that, my only other thought too is, so like Cayman's, you know, he and, and Bean, when I studied with Bean, he had the profiler set up so the back is finished. So then you get, do not scrape the back. And that's right in that if you have your profile set up, but if, if you don't, maybe the profiler's off, maybe somebody screwed it up before you used it. I always screw up my profiler because I'm like, oh, I want to try this, blah, blah, blah. And then I forget and I, I'm not organized enough to label it. And so I just end up with like, well, the back's at 44. I guess I'm going to hand profile the back, you know. Um, so anyway, that's just another caveat. Bridget, if your profiler's set up perfectly in the back, just throw everything I said out. <laughs> it is not. Oh. Okay. Peter, do you want to play yours while she's scraping? Yeah, sure. Let me, I'm going to try to use my other mic. So let me know if it. Can't hear you. Bad. Okay. I'll just hopefully. Good now. Let's hope that this works. So usually I just like to do something like an F major to just see how the air is flowing. And then I check the response. This one is also like Bridget's. It's um, on day three now. So this is the beginning day three read. And I'm, it's a little bit buzzy, but not. it's not offending me at this point. But I'm not quite happy enough with the response on it. OK. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Was that slurred, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it has a response. I like to do both low F piano and um, F sharp and see how it tapers. I like to see if it can attack a low F really quiet in tune, um, which okay. this one is having some trouble with, I think. I kind of 
I get that like there's that like that start that I don't want, and then same thing with F sharp, it like cuts off. There's just that stop. What do you think that stop is? I think it's an issue in a taper somewhere. Um, what I can't decide if is it's when I'm looking at it, if it, the, I think that the taper at the tip could maybe be a bit more, but I'm also noticing like a, the taper between the middle and the tip is not quite even. Okay. Okay. So cool. You could use, you could even use a dial for that. Are you saying the middle of the middle or just. I, I, the, the spine, like using my dial, it's at the measurements I want it to be at. Okay. Um, Could I mention something that kind of helps me when I have the same problem? Yeah. Please, um, yeah. One thing that uh, Mr. Bean showed me that was a pretty big game changer was uh, if I'm not sure of where on the read it's not tapering, um, or if I don't know what needs to be fixed, um, he me to draw a line straight up and down the read along the spine. Uh, and then take the tip of my file and just my own self, like visually, I put the tip of the file at the back in the center, and then I slowly just drag it towards the, the corner of one side. And I just look to see where it doesn't taper. And I find that by having the file, like kind of pointing at each spot on the way, it makes the bigger picture a lot clearer of like where it needs to actually taper more. And then I do the same thing to the other half and then I flip it over and I look at both sides. Cool. Yeah. Try that. Try that, Peter. Draw the pencil line down the middle. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. My other thought, Peter, when you described that, thanks Jordan, that that's a great suggestion. Um, what are your diagonal? So, Obviously there's center to, to side taper and there's back to front taper, but I think often what gets neglected are these diagonal tapers. And, you know, so this A to B, is that gonna really go down? Or this may be mathematically impossible. I'm not I'm not good at geometry enough to understand this, but you may sometimes I see this in reads where like A to C looks good and A to D looks good. But this A to B really is just doesn't have a taper. And yeah. so those diagonals, you know, the read, we, we look at it on paper and we talk about it on paper and we talk about it in, in these two planes, but really like what is the read in this three dimensional plane? So if this is your corner and this is the center of your back, what's the difference here, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Peter, that would give you what you're looking for. I mean, you said it's on the edge of buzzy. It's not bothering you, but it's, it's where it's okay. To me, if the middle is done, that would make sense that the read that's as buzzy as it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to scrape anywhere, but the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think anywhere as you go out to the sides, it's more and more darkening. So yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's the middle to the channel that doesn't taper. Or maybe it's the middle, or maybe it's the channel to the rail. So middle to channel, channel to rail, or middle to rail. But in any case, you're probably scraping the sides, right? Some form of the sides. Yeah. Some form of the channel and rail regions. Um, you know, that's something too I should clarify. When I say rail, I generally actually mean this whole region let me erase some of this. Okay, so here, let's just erase all that. Here's the middle. I generally mean this whole region, not just the very edge. So this to me is the rail. Sort of like the, if you divided the read into sixths, sixth going this way, the outermost sixths, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, Okay, so you look for those tapers. Bridget looks ready to play her test. And, and tell us, Bridget, what you found and where you scraped. Yeah, so I just cleaned up right in front of the collar. Um, I found some unevenness from the back to the tip. 
um, in that small little area back there because I put in a collar on this read and I, I don't always do that as patiently as I should. Um, so I cleaned that up a bit and I think it made a difference. It brought down the pitch a bit. Good. Ah, um, I hear a bit of a difference in sound to a little less, um, yeah, buzzy, I guess is the word, a little calmer. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy that. Yeah. Um, I notice yeah. more evenness. There's a more evenness to the resistance. So notes didn't stick out because, oh, that note's really resistant. I think because you freed it, scraping both the middle and the back, both of those are freeing. So you got a lot, you know, you got like plus four on the resistance. And so now your air evened it out more. But the other thing I'll say is in some ways, I do hear what you mean, the sound is more balanced maybe, but in some ways it might actually be even more, um, not buzzy, but active. I think buzzy is a hard word to define, right? Does buzzy really mean imbalanced or does it mean active? Because in some way I hear increased sort of, I don't know. I mean, again, all these words are imprecise, but richness. Um, and I think that's from scraping the middle. If you scrape anywhere in the middle, it's gonna be richening versus scraping on the sides, which is gonna be dampening. So even though it's the back, which is dampening in a way, or balance, see, maybe dampening is the wrong word there. As Han said, maybe scraping in the back is really more balancing. Well, no, I, I, think of, I think of taking out the back as dampening, definitely. I mean, it's, yeah. again, for the Garfield style, you, you take the back to get, I mean, he talks about like, kind of like you're getting lower overtones basically in the sound, so you right. the sound, and you get a more responsive, reactive sound, but it is more of that more covered metal quality, I okay. guess. But is Bill, if Bill is still watching the stream, Bill, what are your thoughts on scraping the back and dampening? And he always talks about, you know, his first job in Dallas was second bassoon. And then he was second bassoon in Chicago too, I believe. He scrapes the back a lot because he, you know, Hans, as you said, helping the low register, um, getting low notes down to pitch, but uh, it's a fascinating thing to just try to unravel. And I think it's why it makes read making so confusing. Um, because you maybe added depth to the sound, Bridget, and so that's less buzziness. And at the same time, you made it richer or more vibrant, which is from scraping in the middle. Because it was the middle of the back, didn't you say sort of, or was it the sides of the back? Um, just ba the, I'd say the strip in front of the collar. So not too far away from that into the middle. Okay. Cool. Sorry, when I mean, I mean middle as in, middle as in center to side. This is the, we need different terms for this. So, you're in the back, let's say third. So you're in the back. And then I just imagined you scraped here mostly. So yeah, were, there were a few. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. There Tom. were a few little chunks left um, on either side of the back too. Got so it. I, okay. I mean, very little, but enough <laughs> to make a difference. Right. Cool. No, it's great. Um, cool. Uh, and now what would you do, Bridget, on this? You've got a day three-ish now. It's like day 2.5. Would you play mildew scales? I mean, that's an interesting... I've been testing for me day three. I've said I, I wanted to play a mildew scale. I wanted to play real music. Because sometimes I can go down this scale and long tone rabbit hole where I think it plays well and I think it plays in tune. And then I try to play it on music and it's just not a read yet. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I would not play excerpts on it yet, but I would play maybe etudes um, if it was doing well on the scales and response tones and stuff. So. Great. That makes sense to me too. It's something intangible about just playing music on it. And if I'm not able to move and do the things I want, I realize, oh yeah, actually this read sucks. 
But I thought, you know, like I thought based on the long tones that it was a real read. And then I try to play music and do something artistic. And I'm like, oh, never mind. It, it doesn't, it's not a read. So it's, it helps me. Um, it helps me not play on a bad read for, if you play on a bad read for 30 minutes, I feel it shifts. You're going to start accommodating that and you're going to shift all your fundamentals and it can kind of mess you up. So something I'm always trying to be careful with. So you play some etudes. What etudes are you playing these days? Right now I'm playing some Jean Cor etudes. Um, some, I like not to just do a book straight because I like some variety. So some piards, um, alternating scales and arpeggios, but uh -huh. yeah. Good, great. Is Jean Cor, no, Orofici is the ones that are so weird. I'm just trying yeah. to. See if I, have that. I was gonna do one of those actually for Monday, but I decided against it. <laughs> okay. I was, gonna do, really I was gonna do number seventeen. I like that one. Oh, nice. I don't know that. I have to. I have to. Do it. Oh yeah, it's these Orfici that are just so. I'm playing these, and I'm like, or somebody plays in a lesson. I'm like, what were you thinking, man? Like, why did you? I like, did you I like I like the I like the slow tempi ones, the like allegro ones. I don't like those ones very much. Like they just yeah. sound. I don't want to be mean, but it sounds kind of like nonsense to me. I like the lyrical ones. Yeah, totally. Well, I think that's almost part of the etude is like, can you read all this BS? Like, there's no melody here whatsoever. It's like, that's your melody? Like, what is that? It's just terrible. Oh, definitely. <laughs> and like, none of the notes make sense. You know, like all this low tenor clef, just, it just like won't, it's like, what harmony do you think this fits into? Like, I think that's part of why they're good. You know, they're like a challenge. Like, can you make yourself focus despite all this crap? So I go up and down with them. Uh, Peter, are you, or Jordan, you have something to say? Well, I, I was just gonna say exactly what you said about the Orofichis. Like they, I feel like they really challenge me to like dig really deep and like figure out what the hell he's actually trying to say with these phrases. Right. Um, like sort totally. of invent my own harmony, I guess. Because really, it's strange. You can, you know, see it in a bunch of different ways. Totally. Cool. Yeah. Peter, how's the read coming? Um, first, on Orofici, um, I, I agree that I don't really particularly like the faster ones, but the lyrical ones, what um, I use them for, and a lot of us use them for in Michigan, is um, especially one, it, that one right there, is getting really into all of the like nuances in your air and your sound and how, is it exactly even and even fingers and key noise like i've spent so much time just on the first two measures just trying to make it uh -huh. exactly in tune and even and so but yeah i, I don't like the fast ones yeah this is a good etude this one mm -hmm. this is a really good i mean i think this one is good too because it's so weird and just like this tenor clef these notes just don't make sense this is some part somebody Xerox from the library, and you see somebody's written in all of these, all these tenor notes. But I don't recommend that. Actually, that's not. I haven't fixed this yet, but I would wipe these out. It's not helpful to read something written in. You know, you need to get your brain to read it uh, on its own. But anyway, um, Peter, you want to play that read? Yeah, the read definitely got resp more responsive and sort of in turn got buzzier. Um, uh -huh. But I, the, the response definitely um, got better. <laughs> What do you notice in that scale? What would you? It's still kind of uneven. Um, I just think yeah. the reed doesn't have right now. When I took Kane out of it, it doesn't have the strength it needs um, right now. So I have to sort of find um, if there's a spot. I think that I can actually take some out of the rails because I haven't touched those a lot. Good. And that totally. Yeah. What I heard, you know, you were going on da 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 da. The A stuck out, right? So. Yeah. The A is a very volatile note. And again, the reed with no tapers 
is going to play more volatile than a read. So, and again, this makes sense because you told us the middle is where you want it. So that would be then, well, is this somewhere, you know, is too thick. And so again, when the middle is finished and the rails are not, you're going to get this Whataburger tip opening, which closes like a garage door, like Hans was talking about, rather than a diamond that closes from the sides. And that to me will play that sort of volatile. But again, the other thing, if when you look at it, you look at it and you say, wait, no, actually I have what I want here. So what if you have these tapers here? Your center to side tapers are good actually. You've got seven units of thickness here, four and two. So that's a good taper. The thing I would look for in that case Peter, if you see that on your read, if you say those tapers look good, is look at these diagonals. Those will maybe be the answer. Yeah, I think it's farther back because the tip I think is actually pretty good in terms of like closing um, okay. and shape. But I think that farther back is where um, it's. I'm relying a little bit too much on the gouge and the profile. Okay, good. The other thing we, no one really had this, you guys, all your reads sound pretty good and strong. Um, one thing I'll just say, sometimes with these diagonal tapers, right? So we've got an A. People will screw these up where they'll have a sort of a weak pinch point. So A will be going well, and then they have this, and then B is down here. On a Hertzberg read, this little red X right here, that will make your read weak. And the Hertzberg read, it's already so thin. You can't have those anywhere. You can't have these, I call them like a ski slope. You always need it to be this way. It always needs to be an inflated taper. Even if you're talking about the diagonal, you know? So that's just another thing to look for. People's, people's, people's tapers. <laughs> It's like a, uh, a tongue twister. Peter Piper's pickled tapers. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Look out for in your diagonal, don't let it do this. Anyway, okay, uh, my bad drawings are, are done. Um, what else can we talk about? Any other thoughts? I think this, whoops, has been quite productive. Almost as productive as real life would have been. No one uh, contracted COVID-19, so that's always good. Um, reads are gonna be interesting this coming year. I don't think we'll be playing many people's reads, so maybe you know the ideas and talking about them more than ever will be important and it'll be better, you know, we've gotta get good terminology and we've gotta be, you know, get better understanding. Um, yeah, I don't know. Final thoughts on this? I think like something you brought up earlier that I was thinking about was sort of like looking at what ideas transcend read styles and sort of, you know, are almost universal. And I think that um, what Hans said earlier, symmetry is definitely sort of the biggest one that I think of is that mm -hmm. a lot of times if I'm having a problem with a read and I don't know why, it often has to do with an asymmetry in the read. Because sure. that's what makes like, that's what makes good cane. Good cane is symmetrical mm -hmm. in like all mm -hmm. of its aspects when you break it down. Um, mm -hmm. And it, of course, it's strong enough, but mostly it's just symmetrical. Mm. Cool. That makes sense. I find my favorite thing with cane too seems to be like a certain vibrance. Like it's not stuffy. It kind of vibrates readily, but without being really weak. I don't know. I got this, I was, when I was, I think I was in my senior year of undergrad, I got this cane from Rieger, direct from Rieger in Germany. That was like the fad cane in 2010 was Rieger. Everyone played Rieger. And it just is so stuffy and gummy and just, it has no crispness to it. So I feel like I'm just scarred from that, but that, that totally makes sense. Yeah, the symmetry would be better than anything probably. Yeah, I bought a kilo of Lavoro tube cane. I'm really crossing my fingers. It pans out. Well, I've heard a lot of good things about Lavoro lately, so hopefully that's the case. <laughs> nice. But we'll find out. Yeah, symmetry. I mean, 
I always will keep thinking, but like, again, I was hesitant to start on the, um, the Garfield Reed styles because I was very into the, I mean, I still am, so I use both Reed styles. I'm still trying to figure out both, obviously, like anyone else's, but what I can realize for myself is that if the read itself is vibrating, like how you want it to be, that transcends a lot of like how you get to that point. I am very much in the, like the results and the means, like I care about the result more than anything. Um, like when I'm trying to read, for example, I think for the response, I actually, I don't like the crow itself, but I do like to see like just the amount of air it takes just to get a sound to come out of the read. And I think, again, when it comes to the tippers, there is kind of a little bit of a new way when it comes to the piece of cane. Like you can have a piece of cane that might look absolutely ugly, but like it plays terrific. And you're just like, why is this the case? And it's just a good piece of cane. That's why I'm really adamant about like trying to scrape as quickly as possible and try to find those good pieces of cane. That goes far and yeah. yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, good point. Uh, Jordan, Bridget, final thoughts? I guess I have kind of an abstract question, um, yeah. but I was wondering, so because it's so difficult to describe sound, um, that's something I know I struggle with. I think a lot of people do. Um, I was wondering if you think it would be beneficial to look at a read, like when I play it, look at a overtone kind of breakdown of it, like a frequency analysis. And I wonder, not to say like what a good balance of overtones would be, because I think that's pretty personal, but do you think there'd be a way to do that to get maybe more data about it? Um, that's uh, that's Eric Steves actually has yeah, a uh, posting on his blog actually all about that, where he went into an audio engineer and they like they mapped all the different um, like overtone series that he was producing on different reads. So that might be a cool thing to look into. I found that really fascinating awesome. actually. Yeah. I. I think I saw that, but it was like a, a while ago and I don't remember. Did he connect it with like these words we use um, and I what that looks like? And I mean, he was like talking about different peaks on the overtone series. Like, can I was saying like, there is a peak that was kind of like more into play. Like this was a good read that I had and you can see like there's a more even distribution of the overtone series as compared to like a um, bad unbalanced read which had like more dips and stuff. So the overtones wasn't as um, even so, like, kind of like the sound wasn't as resonant and even across the spectrum, that kind of thing. But I didn't read it too much myself, to be honest, and it's been a long time. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I'm, I'm trying to find the article right now. I can't quite. Hans, if you can find it, I'd love to. Uh... Yeah, I don't remember the title, but I'll have to search for myself, too. I think it was like last year I saw it. So it's been a little while, too, actually. But I know, I should, I know it should be there still. So. Yeah, I, I know the article, too. It's, it's, I think it's kind of old, so it might be far back. Okay, Bridget, you know, somebody was doing that with their phone. Somebody I talked to was trying to mess with that, but I don't I don't remember even who that was telling me that. And it's a really good idea. Um, I don't know. I think, I, I know when I try to, when I say something like buzzy, I try to throw out three or four words to help give the person some context so that if we have a different definition of buzzy, we actually can figure out where what we mean. Mm -hmm. That's my only my only thought because it's so subjective, you know. And um, yeah. and then from like a pedagogical view, would you ever like save a read that you would describe as one way um, to show to a student you were trying to say like this is kind of the sound quality I mean and play sure. that? Or I'm not sure how else like it's so hard to learn what those words sound like. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I guess I do that too, definitely all the time. I mean, in your lessons, I tried to say, okay, you know, I'm going to play on the opposite read mm -hmm. of <laughs> what what they might be playing on so that it, it could be different, you know, and, and it could mm -hmm. just show a different, a different way. Um, I don't know. I, I'm always trying to listen to recordings to get that, to, to hear, oh, okay, let me go listen to Caymans again. Okay, let me listen to Sakakini. Okay, let me listen to Klauser. Let me listen to Millard and Matsukawa and hear all these different styles and hear, oh, I hear what that does in the tenor, or I hear the quality that gives you in this, or the quality that gives you in the vibrato, or, you know. Um, so I think that's sort of what I'm always trying to trying to figure out. One, one thing that's helped me a lot is not thinking too much in terms of like bright or dark. I like to think of it in terms of like vowels, 
like E or O. Um, I think, of course, you can get kind of like an O sound that'd be bright or an E sound that's dark. But I think helping and thinking with that sense more like in a vocal quality of the sound has helped me a lot too. Um, I mean, as a general guideline, obviously there's definitely exceptions, but I kind of think of O kind of being more synonymous with the darker quality of sound. Obviously, it, there is an exception as with anything kind of like in read making, but uh, that's just, that's just kind of like an extra wordplay you can use to kind of think about the sound. Yeah. Quality. I think that's helped me. That's a great point. You know, when Clauser talked to me about that, his read is designed to play very O round vowel at all times, and mine was playing much more E and spready. I thought that was really interesting. Um, he has some really cool thoughts on it. I'd love to see um, a masterclass or, or like a, a blog post from him about his thoughts on just the vowel shape, um, spread versus, you know, wide versus narrow, O versus E. Um, I guess you can have still have a narrow E even too. E. Yeah, I know he's all whenever he would always, I mean, I'm still working on this myself. Like I had a very E, very E bright sound when I came in. I was still struggling with that, of course, like anyone else is, but, um, cause I had a very, very E sound when I first started studying with him. So I had to really focus on playing it more of an O and that's still something I'm trying to get more, especially in the tenor range. But, um, he was always talking about the wires in terms of the tube shape, like being, he always, I mean, obviously at the Hertzberg read, you have to make exceptions because, you can't make completely round wires and the read just wouldn't work with that style. But um, with the Garfield read that I'm using, he would always be talking about making the tube as round as possible to get more of that O oh, quality because you're kind of centering the sound of the read. But again, that's just for that read style. So I guess it can differ from person to person with theirs, but. Sure, cool. Um, could I comment on, uh, to, to bring it back a little bit to what Bridget was talking about, sort of like the harmonic series. Um, I haven't experimented with it too much, but I know uh, one of my studio mates who does and uses it religiously, but in tonal energy in the app, you actually have under, when you go under analysis, um, where it normally shows you the like line, if you click on the, the area down here and then the green bars, it actually, um, it shows oh, yeah. a harmonic series. And you can work on it. Um, again, I haven't done it too much myself, but you can actually look note to note how it changes uh, and how on certain reads that, you know, you'll notice there's a lot more of one area of that graph um, versus the other. I don't know the science behind it. I don't know if it's really the harmonic series or if it's just tonal energy's BS way of explaining it, but it, it has some foundation, I think. That's so awesome. It was the screen one. I actually, I actually use that very same map for when I do drones. Is it the green one you were saying? Yeah, it's that one. Under analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I might take a look at that. That's cool. Thank you. That's really cool. That would be a good way, Bridget, to just be more objective. You could just say, here's the harmonic series that I want, you know, or. Yeah, and, and what's interesting and what I, I, the only time I really like dived in and used it was when I was preparing Figaro um for an uh, for a festival audition i because because it's under that analysis function you can record and then play that back and watch the graph so i recorded my figaro and i slowed it down uh in the app so i listened to it at like 25 percent speed it's painful it's awful to listen to but i noticed that like note to note when i would go e to f sharp you know the graph would look like this and then it would look like this like it would change really drastically so I worked on like whatever I had to do to make that not happen. Cool, that's awesome. Well, it's something we can all investigate. And um, yeah, it looks like, sounds like you guys are all already excellent read makers. Um, and thanks again for doing this and getting together and letting, this, letting me stream this. And um, we will do the masterclass Monday at four Eastern. Um, and we'll just get on this same Zoom channel. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let me know, email me if you have any questions or in the Facebook chat. And if anyone is still watching on YouTube, thanks for watching and hope to see you Monday. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.